the polity of the athenians and the lacedaemonians this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by phil chenevere baton rouge louisiana the polity of the athenians by xenophon translated by h g dakins part one now as concerning the polity of the athenians and the type or manner of constitution which they have chosen i praise it not in so far as the very choice involves the welfare of the baser folk as opposed to that of the better class i repeat i withhold my praise so far but given the fact that this is the type agreed upon i propose to show that they set about its preservation in the right way and that those other transactions in connection with it which are looked upon as blunders by the rest of the hellenic world are the reverse in the first place i maintain it is only just that the poorer classes and the people of athens should be better off than the men of birth and wealth seeing that it is the people who man the fleet and put round the city her girdle of power the steersman the boatswain the lieutenant the lookout man at the prow the shipwright these are the people who engird the city with power far rather than her heavy infantry and men of birth of quality this being the case it seems only just that offices of state should be thrown open to every one both in the ballot and the show of hands and that the right of speech should belong to any one who likes without restriction for observe there are many of these offices which according as they are in good or bad hands are a source of safety or of danger to the people and in these the people prudently abstains from sharing for instance it does not think it incumbent on itself to share in the functions of the general or of the commander of cavalry the sovereign people recognizes the fact that in foregoing the personal exercise of these offices and leaving them in the control of the more powerful citizens it secures the balance of advantage to itself it is only those departments of government which bring emolument and assist the private estate that the people care to keep in its own hands in the next place in regard to what some people are puzzled to explain the fact that everywhere greater consideration is shown to the base to poor people and to common folk than to persons of good quality so far from being a matter of surprise this as can be shown is the keystone of the preservation of the democracy it is these poor people this common folk this riffraff whose prosperity combined with the growth of their numbers enhances the democracy whereas the shifting of fortune to the advantage of the wealthy and the better classes implies the establishment on the part of the commonality of a strong power in opposition to itself in fact all the world over the cream of society is in opposition to the democracy naturally since the smallest amount of intemperance and injustice together with the highest scrupulousness in the pursuit of excellence is to be found in the ranks of the better class while within the ranks of the people will be found the greatest amount of ignorance disorderliness rascality poverty acting as a stronger incentive to base conduct not to speak of lack of education and ignorance traceable to the lack of means which afflict the average of mankind the objection may be raised that it was a mistake to allow the universal right of speech and a seat in council these should have been reserved for the cleverest the flower of the community but here again it will be found that they are acting with wise deliberation in granting to even the baser sort the right of speech for supposing only the better people might speak or sit in council blessings would fall to the lot of those like themselves but to the commonality the reverse of blessings 
whereas now anyone who likes any base fellow may get up and discover something to the advantage of himself and his equals it may be retorted and what sort of advantage either for himself or for the people can such a fellow be expected to hit upon the answer to which is that in their judgment the ignorance and baseness of this fellow together with his good will are worth a great deal more to them than your superior person's virtue and wisdom coupled with animosity what it comes to therefore is that a state founded upon such institutions will not be the best state but given a democracy these are the right means to procure its preservation the people it must be borne in mind does not demand that the city should be well governed and itself a slave it desires to be free and to be master as to bad legislation it does not concern itself about that in fact what you believe to be bad legislation is the very source of the people's strength and freedom but if you seek for good legislation in the first place you will see the cleverest members of the community laying down the laws for the rest and in the next place the better class will curb and chastise the lower orders the better class will deliberate in behalf of the state and not suffer crack-brained fellows to sit in council or to speak or vote in parliament no doubt but under the weight of such blessings the people will in a very short time be reduced to slavery another point is the extraordinary amount of license granted to slaves and resident aliens at athens where a blow is illegal and a slave will not step aside to let you pass him in the street i will explain the reason for this peculiar custom supposing it were legal for a slave to be beaten by a free citizen or for a resident alien or freed man to be beaten by a citizen it would frequently happen that an athenian might be mistaken for a slave or an alien and receive a beating since the athenian people is no better clothed than the slave or alien nor in personal appearance is there any superiority or if the fact itself that slaves in athens are allowed to indulge in luxury and indeed in some cases to live magnificently be found astonishing this too it can be shown is done of set purpose where you have a naval power dependent upon wealth we must perforce be slaves to our slaves in order that we may get in our slave rents and to let the real slave go free where you have wealthy slaves it ceases to be advantageous that my slave should stand in awe of you in lacedaemon my slave stands in awe of you but if your slave is in awe of me there will be a risk of his giving away his own monies to avoid running a risk in his own person it is for this reason then that we have established an equality between our slaves and freemen and again between our resident aliens and full citizens because the city stands in need of her resident aliens to meet the requirements of such a multiplicity of arts and for the purposes of her navy that is i repeat the justification for the equality conferred upon our resident aliens citizens devoting their time to gymnastics and to the cultivation of music are not to be found in athens the sovereign people have disestablished them not from any disbelief in the beauty and honor of such training but recognizing the fact that these are things the cultivation of which is beyond its power on the same principle in the case of corrigia the gymnasiarchy and the triarchy the fact is recognized that it is the rich man who trains the chorus and the people for whom the chorus is trained it is the rich man who is triarch or gymnasiarch and the people that profits by their labors in fact what the people look upon as its right is to pocket the money to sing and run and dance and man the vessels is well enough but only in order that the people may be the gainer while the rich are made poorer and so in the course of justice 
justice is not more an object of concern to the jurymen than what touches personal advantage to speak next of the allies and in reference to the point that emissaries from athens come out and according to common opinion calumnate and vent their hatred upon the better sort of the people this is done on the principle that the ruler cannot help being hated by those whom he rules but that if wealth and respectability are to wield power in the subject cities the empire of the athenian people has but a short lease of existence this explains why the better people are punished with infamy robbed of their money driven from their homes and put to death while the baser sort are promoted to honor on the other hand the better athenians throw their aegis over the better class in the allied cities and why because they recognize that it is to the interest of their own class at all times to protect the best element in the cities it may be urged that if it comes to strength and power the real strength of athens lies in the capacity of her allies to contribute their money quota but to the democratic mind it appears a higher advantage still for the individual athenian to get hold of the wealth of the allies leaving them only enough to live upon and to cultivate their estates but powerless to harbor treacherous designs again it is looked upon as a mistaken policy on the part of the athenian democracy to compel her allies to voyage to athens in order to have their cases tried on the other hand it is easy to reckon up what a number of advantages the athenian people derive from the practice impugned in the first place there is the steady receipt of salaries throughout the year derived from the court fees next it enables them to manage their affairs of the allied states while seated at home without the expense of naval expeditions thirdly they thus preserve the partisans of the democracy and ruin her opponents in the law courts whereas supposing the several allied states tried their cases at home being inspired by hostility to athens they would destroy those of their own citizens whose friendship to the athenian people was most marked but besides all this the democracy derives the following advantages from hearing the cases of her allies in athens in the first place the one per cent levied in piraeus is increased to the profit of the state again the owner of a lodging house does better and so too the owner of a pair of beasts or of slaves to be let out on hire again heralds and criers are a class of people who fare better owing to the sojourn of foreigners at athens further still supposing the allies had not to resort to athens for the hearing of cases only the official representative of the imperial state would be held in honor such as the general or tetrarch or ambassador whereas now every single individual among the allies is forced to pay flattery to the people of athens because he knows that he must betake himself to athens and win or lose his case at the bar not of any stray set of judges but of the sovereign people itself such being the law and custom at athens he is compelled to behave as a suppliant in the courts of justice and when some juryman comes into court to grasp his hand for this reason therefore the allies find themselves more and more in the position of slaves to the people of athens furthermore owing to the possession of property beyond the limits of attica and the exercise of magistracies which take them into regions beyond the frontier they and their attendants have insensibly acquired the art of navigation a man who is perpetually voyaging is forced to handle the oar he and his domestics alike and to learn the terms familiar in seamanship hence a stock of skillful mariners is produced bred upon a wide experience of voyaging and practice they have learnt their business some in piloting a small craft others a merchant vessel 
while others have been drafted off from these for service on a ship of war so that the majority of them are now able to row the moment they set foot on board a vessel having been in a state of preliminary practice all their lives part two as to the heavy infantry an arm the deficiency of which at athens is well recognized this is how the matter stands they recognize the fact that in reference to the hostile power they are themselves inferior and must be even if their heavy infantry were more numerous but relative to the allies who bring in the tribute their strength even on land is enormous and they are persuaded that their heavy infantry is sufficient for all purposes provided they retain this superiority apart from all else to a certain extent fortune must be held responsible for the actual condition the subjects of a power which is dominant on land have it open to them to form contingents from several small states and to muster in force for battle but with the subjects of a naval power it is different as far as they are groups of islanders it is impossible for their states to meet together for united action for the sea lies between them and the dominant power is master of the sea even if it were possible for them to assemble in some single island unobserved they would only do so to perish by famine and as to the states subject to athens which are not islanders but situated on the continent the larger are held in check by need and the small ones absolutely by fear since there is no state in existence which does not depend upon imports and exports and these she will forfeit if she does not lend a willing ear to those who are masters by sea in the next place a power dominant by sea can do certain things which a land power is debarred from doing as for instance ravage the territory of a superior since it is always possible to coast along to some point where either there is no hostile force to deal with or merely a small body and in case of an advance in force on the part of the enemy they can take to their ships and sail away such a performance is attended with less difficulty than that experienced by the relieving force on land again it is open to a power so dominating by sea to leave its own territory and sail off on as long a voyage as you please whereas the land power cannot place more than a few days journey between itself and its own territory for marches are slow affairs and it is not possible for an army on the march to have food supplies to last for any great length of time such an army must either march through friendly territory or it must force a way by victory in battle the voyager meanwhile has it in his power to disembark at any point where he finds himself in superior force or at the worst to coast by until he reaches either a friendly district or an enemy too weak to resist again those diseases to which the fruits of the earth are liable as visitations from heaven fall severely on a land power but are scarcely felt by the naval power for such sicknesses do not visit the whole earth everywhere at once so that the ruler of the sea can get in supplies from a thriving district and if one may descend to more trifling particulars it is to this same large ship of the sea that the athenians owe the discovery in the first place of many of the luxuries of life through intercourse with other countries so that the choice of things of sicily and italy of cyprus and egypt and lydia of pontus or peloponnese or wheresoever else it be all are swept as it were into one centre and all owing as i say to their maritime empire and again in process of listening to every form of speech they have selected this from one place and that from another for themselves so much so that while the rest of the hellenes employ each pretty much their own peculiar mode of speech habit of life and style of dress the athenians have adopted a composite type to which all sections of hellas and the foreigner alike have contributed 
as regards sacrifices and temples and festivals and sacred enclosures the people sees that it is not possible for every poor citizen to do sacrifice and hold festival or to set up temples and to inhabit a large and beautiful city but it has hit upon a means of meeting the difficulty they sacrifice that is the whole state sacrifices at the public cost a large number of victims but it is the people that keeps holiday and distributes the victims by lot amongst its members rich men may have in some cases private gymnasia and baths with dressing rooms but the people takes care to have built at the public cost a number of palestras dressing rooms and bathing establishments for its own special use and the mob gets the benefit of the majority of these rather than the select few or the well-to-do as to wealth the athenians are exceptionally placed with regard to hellenic and foreign communities alike in their ability to hold it for given that some state or other is rich in timber for shipbuilding where is it to find a market for the product except by persuading the ruler of the sea or suppose the wealth of some state or other to consist of iron or may be of bronze or of linen yarn where will it find a market except by permission of the supreme maritime power yet these are the very things you see which i need for my ships timber i must have from one and from another iron from a third bronze and from a fourth yarn from a fifth wax etc besides which they will not suffer their antagonists in these parts to carry these products elsewhither or they will cease to use the sea accordingly i without one stroke of labor extract from the land and possess all these good things thanks to my supremacy on the sea whilst not a single other state possesses the two of them not timber for instance and yarn together the same city but where yarn is abundant the soil will be light and devoid of timber and in the same way bronze and iron will not be products of the same city and so for the rest never two or at best three in one state but one thing here and another thing there moreover above and beyond what has been said the coastline of every mainland presents either some jutting promontory or adjacent island or narrow strait of some sort so that those who are masters of the sea can come to moorings at one of these points and wreak vengeance on the inhabitants of the mainland there is just one thing which the athenians lack supposing that they were the inhabitants of an island and were still as now rulers of the sea they would have it in their power to work whatever mischief they liked and to suffer no evil in return as long as they kept command of the sea neither the ravaging of their territory nor the expectation of an enemy's approach whereas at present the farming portion of the community and the wealthy landowners are ready to cringe before the enemy overmuch whilst the people knowing full well come what may not one stock or stone of their property will suffer nothing will be cut down nothing burnt lives in freedom from alarm without fawning at the enemy's approach besides this there is another fear from which they would have been exempt in an island home the apprehension of the city being at any time betrayed by the oligarchs and the gates thrown open and an enemy bursting suddenly in how could incidents like these have taken place if an island had been their home again had they inhabited an island there would have been no stirring of sedition against the people whereas at present in the event of faction those who set it in foot base their hopes of success on an introduction of an enemy by land but a people inhabiting an island would be free from all anxiety on that score since however they did not chance to inhabit an island from the first what they now do is this they deposit their property in the islands trusting to their command of the sea and they suffer the soil of attica to be ravaged without a sigh to extend pity on that they know 
would be to deprive themselves of other blessings still more precious further states oligarchically governed are forced to ratify their alliances and solemn oaths and if they fail to abide by their contracts the offence by whomsoever committed lies nominally at the door of the oligarchs who entered upon the contract but in the case of engagements entered into by a democracy it is open to the people to throw the blame on the single individual who spoke in favor of some measure or put it to the vote and to maintain to the rest of the world i was not present nor do i approve of the terms of the agreement inquiries are made in a full meeting of the people and should any of these things be disapproved of it can at once discover ten thousand excuses to avoid doing whatever they do not wish and if any mischief should spring out of any resolutions which the people has passed in council the people can readily shift the blame from its own shoulders a handful of oligarchs acting against the interests of the people have ruined us but if any good result ensue they the people at once take the credit of that to themselves in the same spirit it is not allowed to caricature on the comic stage or otherwise libel the people because they do not care to hear themselves ill spoken of but if any one has a desire to satirize his neighbor he has full leave to do so and this because they are well aware that as a general rule the person caricatured does not belong to the people or the masses he is more likely to be some wealthy or well-born person or man of means and influence in fact few poor people and of the popular stamp incur the comic lash or if they do they have brought it on themselves by excessive love of meddling or some such covetous self-seeking at the expense of the people so that no particular annoyance is felt at seeing such folk satirized what then i venture to assert is that the people of athens has no difficulty in recognizing which of its citizens are of the better sort and which the opposite and so recognizing those who are serviceable and advantageous to itself even though they be base the people loves them but the good folk they are disposed rather to hate this virtue of theirs the people holds is not ingrained in their nature for any good to itself but rather for its injury in direct opposition to this there are some persons who being born of the people are yet by natural instinct not commoners for my part i pardon the people its own democracy as indeed it is pardonable to any one to do good to himself but the man who not being himself one of the people prefers to live in a state democratically governed rather than in an oligarchical state may be said to smooth his own path towards iniquity he knows that a bad man has a better chance of slipping through the fingers of justice in a democracy than in an oligarchical state part three i repeat that my position concerning the polity of the athenians is this the type of polity is not to my taste but given that a democratic form of government has been agreed upon they do seem to me to go the right way to preserve the democracy by the adoption of the particular type which i have set forth but there are other objections brought as i am aware against the athenians by certain people and to this effect it not seldom happens they tell us that a man is unable to transact a piece of business with the senate or the people even if he sit waiting a whole year now this does happen at athens and for no other reason save that owing to the immense mass of affairs they are unable to work off all the business at hand and dismiss the applicants and how in the world should they be able considering in the first place that they the athenians have more festivals to celebrate than any other state throughout the length and breadth of hellas during these festivals of course the transaction of any sort of affairs of state is still more out of the question 
in the next place only consider the number of cases they have to decide what with private suits and public causes and scrutinies of accounts etc more than the whole of the rest of mankind put together while the senate has multifarious points to advise upon concerning peace and war concerning ways and means concerning the framing and passing of laws and concerning the thousand and one matters affecting the state perpetually occurring and endless questions touching the allies besides the receipt of the tribute the superintendency of dockyards and temples etc can i ask again any one find it at all surprising that with all these affairs on their hands they are unequal to doing business with all the world but some people tell us that if the applicant will only address himself to the senate or the people with a fee in his hand he will do a good stroke of business and for my part i am free to confess to these gainsayers that a good many things may be done at athens by dint of money and i will add that a good many more still might be done if the money flowed still more freely and from more pockets one thing however i know full well that as to transacting with every one of these applicants all he wants the state could not do it not even if all the gold and silver in the world were the inducement offered here are some of the cases which have to be decided on someone fails to fit out a ship judgment must be given another puts up a building on a piece of public land again judgment must be given or to take another class of cases adjudication has to be made between the karaji for the dionysia the thargelia the panathenia year after year and again in behalf of the gymnasiarchs a similar adjudication for the panathenia the promethenia and the hepestia also year after year also as between the tetrarchs four hundred of whom are appointed each year of these two any who may choose must have their cases adjudicated on year after year but that is not all there are various magistrates to examine and approve and decide between there are orphans whose status must be examined and guardians of prisoners to appoint these be it borne in mind are all matters of yearly occurrence while at intervals there are exceptions and abstentions from military service which call for adjudication or in connection with some other extraordinary misdemeanor some case of outrage and violence of an exceptional character or some charge of impiety a whole string of others i simply omit i am content to have named the most important part with the exception of the assessments of tribute which occur as a rule at intervals of five years i put it to you then can any one suppose that all or any of these may dispense with adjudication if so will any one say which ought and which ought not to be adjudicated on there and then if on the other hand we are forced to admit that these are all fair cases for adjudication it follows of necessity that they should be decided during the twelve month since even now the boards of judges sitting right through the year are powerless to stay the tide of evil doing by reason of the multitude of the people so far so good but some one will say try the cases you certainly must but lessen the number of the judges but if so it follows of necessity that unless the number of courts themselves are diminished in number there will only be a few judges sitting in each court with the further consequence that in dealing with so small a body of judges it will be easier for a litigant to present an invulnerable front to the court and to bribe the whole body to the great detriment of justice but besides this we cannot escape the conclusion that the athenians have their festivals to keep during which the courts cannot sit as a matter of fact these festivals are twice as numerous as those of any other people but i will reckon them as merely equal to those of the state which has the fewest this being so 
I maintain that it is not possible for business affairs at Athens to stand on any very different footing from the present, except to some slight extent, by adding here and deducting there. Any large modification is out of the question, short of damaging the democracy itself. No doubt many expedients might be discovered for improving the Constitution, but if the problem be to discover some adequate means of improving the Constitution, while at the same time the democracy is to remain intact? I say it is not easy to do this, except, as I have just stated, to the extent of some trifling addition here or deduction there. There is another point in which it is sometimes felt that the Athenians are ill-advised, in their adoption, namely, of the less respectable party in a state divided by faction. But if so, they do it advisedly. If they chose the more respectable, they would be adopting those whose views and interests differ from their own, for there is no state in which the best element is friendly to the people. It is the worst element which in every state favors the democracy, on the principle that like favors like. It is simple enough, then. The Athenians choose what is most akin to themselves. Also, on every occasion on which they have attempted to side with the better classes, it has not fared well with them, but within a short interval the democratic party has been enslaved, as, for instance, in Boethia or as when they chose the aristocrats of the Milesians, and within a short time these revolted and cut the people to pieces, or when they chose the Lacedaemonians as against the Messenians, and within a short time the Lacedaemonians subjugated the Messenians and went to war against Athens. I seem to overhear a retort. No one, of course, is deprived of his civil rights at Athens unjustly my answer is that there are some who are unjustly deprived of their civil rights though the cases are certainly rare but it will take more than a few to attack the democracy at athens since you may take it as an established fact it is not the man who has lost his civil rights justly that takes the matter to heart but the victims if any of injustice but how in the world can any one imagine that many are in a state of civil disability at Athens, where the people and the holders of office are one and the same? It is from iniquitous exercise of office, from iniquity exhibited either in speech or action, and the like circumstances, that citizens are punished with deprivation of civil rights in Athens. Due reflection on these matters will serve to dispel the notion that there is any danger at Athens from persons visited with disenfranchisement. End of The Polity of the Athenians by Xenophon The Polity of the Lacedaemonians by Xenophon Translated by H. G. Dakins. Parts 1 through 7. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Parts 1 through 7. Part 1. I recall the astonishment with which I first noted the unique position of Sparta amongst the states of Hellas, the relatively sparse population, and at the same time the extraordinary power and prestige of the community. I was puzzled to account for the fact. It was only when I came to consider the peculiar institutions of the Spartans that my wonderment ceased. Or rather, it is transferred to the legislator who gave them those laws, obedience to which has been the secret of their prosperity. This legislator, Lysurgis, I must needs admire and hold him to have been one of the wisest of mankind. Certainly he was no servile imitator of other states. It was by a stroke of invention, rather, and on a pattern much in opposition to the commonly accepted one, that he brought his fatherland to this pinnacle of prosperity. Take, for example, and it is well to begin at the beginning, the whole topic of the begetting and rearing of children. 
Throughout the rest of the world, the young girl, who will one day become a mother, and I speak of those who may be held to be well brought up, is nurtured on the plainest food attainable, with the scantiest attention of meat or other condiments, whilst as to wine they train them either to total abstinence or to take it highly diluted with water. And in imitation, as it were, of the handicraft type, since the majority of artificers are sedentary, we, the rest of the Hellenes, are content that our girls should sit quietly and work wolves. That is all we demand of them. But how are we to expect that women nurtured in this fashion should produce a splendid offspring? Lysurgia pursued a different path. Clothes were things, he held, the furnishing of which might well enough be left to female slaves. And, believing that the highest function of a free woman was the bearing of children, in the first place he insisted on the training of the body as incumbent no less on the female than the male, and, in pursuit of the same idea, instituted rival contests in running and feats of strength for women as for men. His belief was that where both parents were strong, their progeny would be found to be more vigorous. And so again after marriage. In view of the fact that immoderate intercourse is elsewhere permitted during the earlier period of matrimony, he adopted a principle directly opposite. He laid it down as an ordinance that a man should be ashamed to be seen visiting the chamber of his wife, whether going in or coming out. When they did meet, under such restraint, the mutual longing of these lovers could not but be increased, and the fruit which might spring from such intercourse would tend to be more robust than theirs whose affections are cloyed by satiety. By a further step in the same direction, he refused to allow marriages to be contracted at any period of life according to the fancy of the parties concerned. Marriage, as he ordained it, must only take place in the prime of bodily vigor this too being as he believed a condition conducive to the production of healthy offspring or again to meet the case which might occur of an old man wedded to a young wife considering the jealous watch which such husbands are apt to keep over their wives he introduced a directly opposite custom that is to say he made it incumbent on the aged husband to introduce someone whose qualities, physical and moral, he admired, to play the husband's part and to beget him children. Or again, in the case of a man who might not desire to live with a wife permanently, but yet might still be anxious to have children of his own, worthy the name, the lawgiver laid down a law in his behalf. Such a one might select some woman, the wife of some man, well-born herself and blessed with fair offspring, and, the sanction and consent of her husband first obtained, raise up children for himself through her. These and many other adaptations of a like sort the law gave her sanctioned. As, for instance, at Sparta, a wife will not object to bear the burden of a double establishment, or a husband to adopt sons as foster brothers of his own children, with a full share in his family and position, but possessing no claim to his wealth and property. So opposed to those of the rest of the world are the principles which Lysurgus devised in reference to the production of children. Whether they enabled him to provide Sparta with a race of men superior to all in size and strength, I leave to the judgment of whomsoever it may concern. Part 2 With this exposition of the customs in connection with the birth of children, I wish now to explain the systems of education in fashion here and elsewhere. Throughout the rest of Hellas, the custom on the part of those who claim to educate their sons in the best way is as follows. As soon as the children are of an age to understand what is said to them, they are immediately placed under the charge of pedagogi, or tutors, who are also attendants, and sent off to the school of some teacher to be taught grammar, music, and the concerns of the palestra. Besides this, they are given shoes to wear, which tend to make their feet tender, and their bodies are innervated by various changes of clothing. And as for food, 
the only measure recognized is that which is fixed by appetite but when we turn to lycurgus instead of leaving it to each member of the state privately to appoint a slave to be his son's tutor he set over the young spartans a public guardian the paidonomos or pastor to give them his proper title with complete authority over them this guardian was selected from those who filled the highest magistracies he had authority to hold musters of the boys and as their overseer in case of any misbehavior to chastise severely the legislator further provided his pastor with a body of youths in the prime of life and bearing whips to inflict punishment when necessary with this happy result that in sparta modesty and obedience ever go hand in hand nor is there lack of either instead of softening their feet with shoe or sandal his rule was to make them hardy through going barefoot this habit if practised would as he believed enable them to scale heights more easily and clamber down precipices with less danger in fact with his feet so trained the young spartan would leap and spring and run faster unshod than another shod in the ordinary way instead of making them effeminate with a variety of clothes his rule was to habituate them to a single garment the whole year through thinking that so they would be better prepared to withstand the variations of heat and cold again as regards food according to his regulation the iron or head of the flock must see that his messmates gathered to the club meal with such moderate food as to avoid that heaviness which is engendered by repletion and yet not to remain altogether unacquainted with the pains of penurious living his belief was that by such training in boyhood they would be better able when occasion demanded to continue toiling on an empty stomach they would be all the fitter if the word of command were given to remain on the stretch for a long time without extra dieting the craving for luxuries would be less the readiness to take any visual set before them greater and in general the regime would be found more healthy under it he thought the lads would increase in stature and shape into finer men since as he maintained a dietary which gave suppleness to the limbs must be more conducive to both ends than one which added thickness to the bodily parts by feeding on the other hand in order to guard against a too great pinch of starvation though he did not actually allow the boys to help themselves without further trouble to what they needed more he did give them permission to steal this thing or that in the effort to alleviate their hunger it was not of course from any real difficulty how else to supply them with nutriment that he left it to them to provide themselves by this crafty method nor can i conceive that any one will so misinterpret the custom clearly its explanation lies in the fact that he who would live the life of a robber must forego sleep by night and in the daytime he must employ shifts and lie in ambuscade he must prepare and make ready his scouts and so forth if he is to succeed in capturing the quarry it is obvious i say that the whole of this education tended and was intended to make the boy craftier and more inventive in getting in supplies while at the same time it cultivated their warlike instincts an objector may retort but if he thought it was so fine a feat to steal why did he inflict all those blows on the unfortunate who was caught my answer is for the self-same reason which induces people in other matters which are taught to punish the malperformance of a service so they the lacedaemonians visit penalties on the boy who is detected thieving as being but a sorry bungler in the art so to steal as many cheeses as possible off the shrine of orthia was a feat to be encouraged but at the same time others were enjoined to scourge the thief which would point a moral not obscurely that by pain endured for a brief season a man may earn the joyous reward of lasting glory 
Herein, too, it is plainly shown that where speed is requisite, the sluggard will win for himself much trouble and scant good. Furthermore, and in order that the boy should not want a ruler, even in case the pastor himself were absent, he gave to any citizen who chanced to be present authority to lay upon them injunctions for their good and to chastise them for any trespass committed. By so doing, he created in the boys of Sparta a most rare modesty and reverence. And indeed, there is nothing which, whether as boys or men, they respect more highly than the ruler. Lastly, and with the same intention, that the boys must never be reft of a ruler, even if by chance there were no grown man present, he laid down the rule that in such a case the most active of the leaders or prefects was to become ruler for the nonce each of his own division. The conclusion being that under no circumstances whatever are the boys of Sparta destitute of one to rule them. I ought, as it seems to me, not to omit some remark on the subject of boy attachments, it being a topic in close connection with that of boyhood and the training of boys. We know that the rest of the Hellenes deal with this relationship in different ways, either after the manner of the Boeotians, where man and boy are intimately united by a bond like that of wedlock, or after the manner of the Elians, where the fruition of beauty is an act of grace whilst there are others who would absolutely debar the lover from any conversation and discourse with the beloved. Lycurgus adopted a system opposed to all of these alike. Given that someone, himself being all that a man ought to be, should in admiration of a boy's soul endeavor to discover in him a true friend without reproach, and to consort with him, this was a relationship which Lycurgus commended, and indeed regarded as the noblest type of bringing up but if as was evident it was not an attachment to the soul but a yearning merely towards the body he stamped this thing as foul and horrible and with this result to the credit of lycurgus be it said that in lacedaemon the relationship of lover and beloved is like that of a parent and child or brother and brother where carnal appetite is in the abeyance. That this, however, which is the fact, should be scarcely credited in some quarters, does not surprise me, seeing that in many states the laws do not oppose the desires in question. I have now described the two chief methods of education in vogue. That is to say, the Lacedaemonian as contrasted with that of the rest of Hellas, and I leave it to the judgment of him whom it may concern, which of the two has produced the finer type of men. And by finer I mean the better disciplined, the more modest and reverential, and in matters where self-restraint is a virtue, the more content. Part 3 Coming to the critical period at which a boy ceases to be a boy and becomes a youth, we find that it is just then that the rest of the world proceeds to emancipate their children from the private tutor and the schoolmaster, and, without substituting any further ruler, are content to launch them into absolute independence. Here again Lycurgus took an entirely opposite view of the matter. This, if observation might be trusted, was the season when the tide of animal spirits flows fast and the froth of insolence rises to the surface, when, too, the most violent appetites for diverse pleasures in serried ranks invade the mind. This, then, was the right moment at which to impose tenfold labors upon the growing youth, and to devise for him a subtle system of absorbing occupation. And by a crowning enactment, which said that, he who shrank from the duties imposed on him would forfeit henceforth all claim to the glorious honors of the state. He caused not only the public authorities, but those personally interested in the several companies of youths to take serious pains so that no single individual of them should by an act of craven cowardice find himself utterly rejected and reprobate within the body politic. Furthermore, 
in his desire to implant in their youthful souls a root of modesty he imposed upon these bigger boys a special rule in the very streets they were to keep their two hands within the folds of the cloak they were to walk in silence and without turning their heads to gaze now here now there but rather to keep their eyes fixed upon the ground before them and hereby it would seem to be proved conclusively that even in the matter of quiet bearing and sobriety the masculine type may claim greater strength than that which we attribute to the nature of women at any rate you might sooner expect a stone image to find voice than one of those spartan youths to divert the eyes of some bronze statue were less difficult and as to quiet bearing no bride ever stepped in bridal bower with more natural modesty note them when they have reached the public table the plainest answer to the question asked that is all you need expect to hear from their lips part four but if he was thus careful in the education of the stripling the spartan lawgiver showed a still greater anxiety in dealing with those who had reached the prime of opening manhood considering their immense importance to the city in the scale of good if only they proved themselves the men they should be he had only to look around to see what wherever the spirit of emulation is most deeply seated there too their choruses and gymnastic contests will present alike a far higher charm to eye and ear and on the same principle he persuaded himself that he needed only to confront his youthful warriors in the strife of valor and with like result they also in their degree might be expected to attain to some unknown height of manly virtue what method he adopted to engage these combatants i will now explain it is on this wise their ephors selected three men out of the whole body of the citizens in the prime of life these three are named hippogratae or masters of the horse each of these selects one hundred others being bound to explain for what reason he prefers in honor these and disapproves of those the result is that those who fail to obtain the distinction are now at open war not only with those who rejected them but with those who were chosen in their stead and they keep ever a jealous eye on one another to detect some slip of conduct contrary to the high code of honor there held customary and so is set on foot that strife in truest sense acceptable to heaven and for the purposes of state most politic it is a strife in which not only is the pattern of a brave man's conduct fully set forth but where too each against other and in separate camps the rival parties train for victory one day the superiority shall be theirs or in the day of need one and all to the last man they will be ready to aid the fatherland with all their strength necessity moreover is laid upon them to study a good habit of the body coming as they do to blows with their fists for very strife's sake whenever they meet albeit any one present has a right to separate the combatants and if obedience is not shown to the peacemaker the pastor of youth hails the delinquent before the ephors and the ephors inflict heavy damages since they will have it plainly understood that rage must never override obedience to law with regard to those who have already passed the vigor of early manhood and on whom the highest magistracies henceforth devolve there is a like contrast in hellas generally we find that in this age the need of further attention to physical strength is removed although the imposition of military service continues but lycurgus made it customary for that section of his citizens to regard hunting as the highest honor suited to their age albeit not to the exclusion of any public duty and his aim was that they might be equally able to undergo the fatigues of war with those in the prime of early manhood part five 
the above is a fairly exhaustive statement of the institutions traceable to the legislation of lycurgus in connection with the successive stages of a citizen's life it remains that i should endeavor to describe the style of living which he established for the whole body irrespective of age it will be understood that when lycurgus first came to deal with the question the spartans like the rest of the hellenes used to mess privately at home tracing more than half the current misdemeanors to this custom he was determined to drag his people out of holes and corners into the broad daylight and so he invented the public mess rooms whereby he expected at any rate to minimize the transgression of orders as to food his ordinance allowed them so much as while not inducing repletion should guard them from actual want and in fact there are many exceptional dishes in the shape of game supplied from the hunting field or as a substitute for these rich men will occasionally garnish the feast with wheaten loaves so that from beginning to end till the mess breaks up the common board is never stinted for viands nor yet extravagantly furnished so also in the matter of drink whilst putting a stop to all unnecessary potations detrimental alike to a firm brain and a steady gait he left them free to quench thirst when nature dictated a method which would at once add to the pleasure whilst it diminished the danger of drinking and indeed one may fairly ask how on such a system of common meals it would be possible for any one to ruin either himself or his family either through gluttony or wine-bibbing this too must be borne in mind that in other states equals in age for the most part associate together and such an atmosphere is little conducive to modesty whereas in sparta lycurgus was careful so to blend the ages that the younger men must benefit largely by the experience of the elder an education in itself and the more so since by custom of the country conversation at the common meal has reference to the honorable acts which this man or that man may have performed in relation to the state the scene in fact but little lends itself to the intrusion of violence or drunken riot ugly speech and ugly deeds alike are out of place amongst other good results obtained through this outdoor system of meals may be mentioned these there is the necessity of walking home when the meal is over and a consequent anxiety not to be caught tripping under the influence of wine since they all know of course that the supper table must be presently abandoned and that they must move as freely in the dark as in the day even the help of a torch to guide the steps being forbidden to all on active service in connection with this matter lycurgus had not failed to observe the effect of equal amounts of food on different persons the hard-working man has a good complexion his muscles are well fed he is robust and strong the man who abstains from work on the other hand may be detected by his miserable appearance he is blotched and puffy and devoid of strength this observation i say was not wasted on him on the contrary turning it over in his mind that any one who chooses as a matter of private judgment to devote himself to toil may hope to present a very creditable appearance physically he enjoined upon the eldest for the time being in every gymnasium to see to it that the labors of the class were proportional to the meats and to my mind he was not out of his reckoning in this manner more than elsewhere at any rate it would be hard to discover a healthier or more completely developed human being physically speaking than the spartan their gymnastic training in fact makes demands alike on the legs and arms and neck etc simultaneously part six there are other points in which this legislator's views run counter to those commonly accepted thus in other states the individual citizen is master over his own children domestics goods and chattels and belongings generally but lycurgus 
whose aim was to secure to all the citizens a considerable share in one another's goods without mutual injury enacted that each one should have an equal power of his neighbor's children as over his own the principle is this when a man knows that this that and the other person are fathers of children subject to his authority he must perforce deal by them even as he desires his own child to be dealt by and if a boy chance to have received a whipping not from his own father but some other and goes and complains to his own father it would be thought wrong on the part of that father if he did not inflict a second whipping on his son a striking proof in its way how completely they trust each other not to impose dishonorable commands upon their children in the same way he empowered them to use their neighbors domestics in case of need this communism he applied also to dogs used for the chase in so far that a party in need of dogs will invite the owner to the chase and if he is not at leisure to attend himself at any rate he is happy to let his dogs go the same applies to the use of his horses someone has fallen sick perhaps or is in want of a carriage or is anxious to reach some point or other quickly in any case he has a right if he sees a horse anywhere to take and use it and restores it safe and sound when he has done with it and here is another institution attributed to lycurgus which scarcely coincides with the customs elsewhere in vogue a hunting party returns from the chase belated they want provisions they have nothing prepared themselves to meet this contingency he made it a rule that owners are to leave behind the food that has been dressed and the party in need will open the seals take out what they want seal up the remainder and leave it accordingly by his system of give and take even those with next to nothing have a share in all that the country can supply if ever they stand in need of anything part seven there are yet other customs in sparta which lycurgus instituted in opposition to those of the rest of hellas and the following among them we all know that in the generality of states every one devotes his full energy to the business of making money one man as a tiller of the soil another as a mariner a third as a merchant while others depend on various arts to earn a living but at sparta Lycurgus forbade his free-born citizens to have anything whatsoever to do with the concerns of money-making. As freemen, he enjoined upon them to regard as their concern exclusively those activities upon which the foundations of civic liberty are based. And indeed, one may well ask, for what reason should wealth be regarded as a matter for serious pursuit in a community where, partly by a system of equal contributions to the necessaries of life and partly by the maintenance of a common standard of living the lawgiver placed so effectual a check upon the desires of riches for the sake of luxury what inducement for instance would there be to make money even for the sake of wearing apparel in a state where personal adornment is held to lie not in the costliness of the clothes they wear but in the healthy condition of the body to be clothed nor again could there be much inducement to amass wealth in order to be able to expend it on the members of a common mess where the legislator had made it seem far more glorious that a man should help his fellows by the labor of his body than by costly outlay the latter being as he finally phrased it the function of wealth the former an activity of the soul he went a step further and set up a strong barrier even in a society such as i have described against the pursuance of money-making by wrongful means in the first place he established a coinage of so extraordinary a sort that even a single sum of ten minas could not come into a house without attracting the notice either of the master himself or of some member of his household in fact it would occupy a considerable space and need a wagon to carry it gold and silver themselves moreover 
are liable to search and in case of detection the possessor subjected to a penalty in fact to repeat the question asked above for what reason should money-making become an earnest pursuit in a community where the possession of wealth entails more pain than its employment brings satisfaction end of sections one through seven The Polity of the Lacedaemonians by Xenophon, translated by H. G. Dakins. Parts 8 through 15. Part 8. But to proceed, we are all aware that there is no state in the world in which greater obedience is shown to magistrates and to the laws themselves than Sparta. But for my part, I am disposed to think that Lycurgus could never have attempted to establish this healthy condition until he had first secured the unanimity of the most powerful members of the state. I infer this for the following reasons. In other states, the leaders in rank and influence do not even desire to be thought to fear the magistrates. Such a thing they would regard as in itself a symbol of servility in sparta on the contrary the stronger a man is the more readily does he bow before constituted authority and indeed they magnified themselves on their humility and on a prompt obedience running or at any rate not crawling with laggard step at the word of command such an example of eager discipline they are persuaded set by themselves will not fail to be followed by the rest and this is precisely what has taken place it is reasonable to suppose that it was these same noblest members of the state who combined to lay the foundation of the ephorate after they had come to the conclusion themselves that of all the blessings which a state or an army or a household can enjoy obedience is the greatest since as they could not but reason the greater the power with which men fence about authority the greater the fascination it will exercise upon the mind of the citizen to the enforcement of obedience accordingly the ephors are competent to punish whomsoever they choose they have power to extract fines or the spur of the moment they have power to depose magistrates in mid-career nay actually to imprison them and bring them to trial on the capital charge entrusted with these vast powers they do not as do the rest of states allow the magistrates elected to exercise authority as they like right through the year of office but in the style rather of despotic monarchs or presidents of the games at the first symptom of an offence against the law they inflict chastisement without warning and without hesitation but of all the many beautiful contrivances invented by lycurgus to enkindle a willing obedience to the laws in the hearts of the citizens none to my mind was happier or more excellent than his unwillingness to deliver his code to the people at large until attended by the most powerful members of the state he had betaken himself to delphi and there made inquiry of the god whether it were better for sparta and conducive to her interests to obey the laws which he had framed and not until the divine answer came better will it be in every way did he deliver them laying it down as a last ordinance that to refuse obedience to a code which had the sanction of the pythian god himself was a thing not illegal only but profane part nine the following two may well excite our admiration for lycurgus i speak of the consummate skill with which he induced the whole state of sparta to regard an honorable death as preferable to an ignoble life and indeed if any one will investigate the matter he will find that by comparison with those who make it a principle to retreat in face of danger 
actually fewer of these spartans die in battle since to speak truth salvation it would seem attends on virtue far more frequently than on cowardice virtue which is at once easier and sweeter richer in resource and stronger of arm than her opposite and that virtue has another familiar attendant to wit glory needs no showing since the whole world would fain ally themselves after some sort in battle with the good yet the actual means by which he gave currency to these principles is a point which it were well not to overlook it is clear that the lawmaker set himself deliberately to provide all the blessings of heaven for the good man and a sorry and ill-starred existence for the coward in other states the man who shows himself base and cowardly wins to himself an evil reputation and the nickname of a coward but that is all for the rest he buys and sells in the same marketplace as the good man he sits beside him at play he exercises with him in the same gymnasium and all as suits his humor but at lacedaemon there is not one man who would not feel ashamed to welcome the coward at the common mess table or to try conclusions with such an antagonist in a wrestling bout consider the day's round of his existence the sides are being picked up in a football match but he is left out as the odd man there is no place for him during the choric dance he is driven away into ignominious quarters nay in the very streets it is he who must step aside for others to pass or being seated he must rise and make room even for a younger man at home he will have his maiden relatives to support in isolation and they will hold him to blame for their unwedded lives a hearth with no wife to bless it that is a condition he must face and yet he will have to pay damages to the last farthing for incurring it let him not roam abroad with a smooth and smiling countenance let him not imitate men whose fame is irreproachable or he shall feel on his back the blows of his superiors such being the weight of infamy which is laid upon all cowards i for my part am not surprised if in sparta they deem death preferable to a life so steeped in dishonor and reproach part ten that too was a happy enactment in my opinion by which lycurgus provided for the continual cultivation of virtue even to old age by fixing the election to the council of elders as a last ordeal at the goal of life he made it impossible for a high standard of virtuous living to be disregarded even in old age so too it is worthy of admiration in him that he lent his helping hand to virtuous old age thus by making the elders sole arbiters in the trial of life he contrived to charge old age with a greater weight of honor than that which is accorded to the strength of mature manhood and assuredly such a contest as this must appeal to the zeal of mortal man beyond all others in a supreme degree fair doubtless are contests of gymnastic skill yet are they but trials of bodily excellence but this contest for the seniority is of a higher sort it is an ordeal of the soul itself in proportion therefore as the soul is worthier than the body so must these contests of the soul appeal to a stronger enthusiasm than their bodily antitypes and yet another point may well excite our admiration for lycurgus largely it has not escaped his observation that communities exist where those who are willing to make virtue their study and delight fail somehow in ability to add to the glory of their fatherland that lesson the legislator laid to heart and in sparta he enforced as a matter of public duty the practice of virtue by every citizen and so it is that just as man differs from man in some excellence according as he cultivates or neglects to cultivate it this city of sparta with good reason 
outshines all other states in virtue since she and she alone has made the attainment of a high standard of noble living a public duty and was this not a noble enactment that whereas other states are content to inflict punishment only in cases where a man does wrong against his neighbor lycurgus imposed penalties no less severe on him who openly neglected to make himself as good as possible for this it seems was his principle in the one case where a man is robbed or defrauded or kidnapped and made a slave of the injury of the misdeed whatever it is is personal to the individual so maltreated but in the other case whole communities suffer foul treason at the hands of the base man and the coward so that it was only reasonable in my opinion that he should visit the heaviest penalty upon these latter moreover he laid upon them like some irrepressible necessity the obligation to cultivate the whole virtue of a citizen provided they duly performed the injunctions of the law the city belonged to them each and all in absolute possession and on an equal footing weakness of limb or want of wealth was no drawback in his eyes but as for him who out of cowardice of his heart shrank from the painful performance of the law's injunction the finger of the legislator pointed him out as there and then disqualified to be regarded longer as a member of the brotherhood of peers it may be added that there was no doubt as to the great antiquity of this code of laws the point is clear so far that lycurgus himself is said to have lived in the days of the heraclidae but being of so long standing these laws even at this day still are stamped in the eyes of other men with all the novelty of youth and the most marvelous thing of all is that while everybody is agreed to praise these remarkable institutions there is not a single state which cares to imitate them part eleven the above form a common stock of blessings open to every spartan to enjoy alike in peace and in war but if any one desires to be informed in what way the legislator improved upon the ordinary machinery of warfare and in reference to an army in the field it is easy to satisfy his curiosity in the first instance the ephors announce by proclamation the limit of age to which the service applies for cavalry and heavy infantry and in the next place for the various handicraftsmen so that even on active service the lacedaemonians are well supplied with all the conveniences enjoyed by people living as citizens at home all implements and instruments whatsoever which an army may need in common are ordered to be in readiness some on wagons and others on baggage animals in this way anything omitted can hardly escape detection for the actual encounter under arms the following inventions are attributed to him the soldier has a crimson colored uniform and a heavy shield of bronze his theory being that such an equipment has no sort of feminine association and is altogether most warrior-like it is most quickly burnished it is least readily soiled he further permitted those who were above the age of early manhood to wear their hair long for so he conceived they would appear of larger stature more free and indomitable and of a more terrible aspect so furnished and accoutred he divided his citizen soldiers into six morai or regimental divisions of cavalry and heavy infantry each of these citizen regiments political divisions has one pole march or colonel four locagoi or captains of companies eight pentaconters or lieutenants each in command of half a company and sixteen inomotarchs or commanders of sections at the word of command any such regimental division can be formed readily either into enomities that is single file or into threes that is three files abreast or into sixes that is six files abreast 
as to the idea commonly entertained that the tactical arrangement of the laconian heavy infantry is highly complicated no conception could be more opposed to fact for in the laconian order the front rank men are all leaders so that each file has everything necessary to play its part efficiently in fact this disposition is so easy to understand that no one who can distinguish one human being from another could fail to follow it one set have the privilege of leaders the other the duty of followers the evolution orders by which greater depth or shallowness is given to the battle line are given by word of mouth by the inamotarch or commander of the section who plays the part of the herald and they cannot be mistaken none of these maneuvers presents any difficulty whatsoever to the understanding but when it comes to their ability to do battle equally well in spite of some confusion which has been set up and whatever the chapter of accidents may confront them with i admit that the tactics here are not so easy to understand except for people trained under the laws of lycurgus even movements which an instructor in heavy armed warfare might look upon as difficult are performed by the lacedaemonians with utmost ease thus the troops we will suppose are marching in column one section of a company is of course stepping up behind another from the rear now if at such a moment a hostile force appears in front in battle order the word is passed down to the commander of each section deploy into line to the left and so throughout the whole length of the column until the line is formed facing the enemy or supposing while in this position an enemy appears in the rear each line performs a countermarch with the effect of bringing the best men face to face with the enemy all along the line as to the point that the leader previously on the right finds himself now on the left they do not consider that they are necessarily losers thereby but as it may turn out even gainers if for instance the enemy attempted to turn their flank he would find himself wrapping round not their exposed but their shielded flank or if for any reason it be thought advisable for the general to keep the right wing they turn the corps about and countermarch by ranks until the leader is on the right and the rear rank on the left or again supposing a division of the enemy appears on the right whilst they are marching in column they have nothing further to do but to wheel each company to the right like a trireme prow forward to meet the enemy and thus the rear company again finds itself on the right if however the enemy should attack on the left either they will not allow of that and push him aside or else they wheel their companies to the left to face the antagonist and thus the rear company once more falls into position on the left part twelve i will now speak of the mode of encampment sanctioned by the regulation of lycurgus to avoid the waste incidental to the angles of a square the encampment according to him should be circular except where there was the security of a hill or fortification or where they had a river in their rear he had sentinels posted during the day along the place of arms and facing inwards since they are appointed not so much for the sake of the enemy as to keep an eye on friends the enemy is sufficiently watched by mounted troopers perched on various points commanding the widest prospect to guard against hostile approach by night sentinel duty according to the ordinance was performed by the skidite outside the main body at the present time the rule is so far modified that the duty is entrusted to foreigners if there be a foreign contingent present with a leaven of spartans themselves to keep them company the custom of always taking their spears with them when they go their rounds must certainly be attributed to the same cause which makes them exclude their slaves from the place of arms nor need we be surprised if when retiring for necessary purposes they only withdraw just far enough from one another or from the place of arms itself not to create annoyance the need of precaution is the whole explanation 
the frequency with which they change their encampments is another point it is done quite as much for the sake of benefiting their friends as of annoying their enemies further the law enjoins upon all lacedaemonians during the whole period of an expedition the constant practice of gymnastic exercises whereby their pride in themselves is increased and they appear freer and of a more liberal aspect than the rest of the world the walk and the running ground must not exceed in length the space covered by a regimental division so that no one may find himself far from his own stand of arms after the gymnastic exercises the senior pole march gives the order by herald to be seated this serves all the purposes of an inspection after this the order is given to get breakfast and for the outposts to be relieved after this again come pastimes and relaxations before the evening exercises after which the herald's cry is heard to take the evening meal when they have sung a hymn to the gods to whom the offerings of a happy omen have been performed the final order retire to rest at the place of arms is given if the story is a little long the reader must not be surprised since it would be difficult to find any point in military matters omitted by the lacedaemonians which seems to demand attention part thirteen i will now give a detailed account of the power and privilege assigned by lycurgus to the king during a campaign to begin with so long as he is on active service the state maintains the king and those with him the pole marches mess with him and share his quarters so that by dint of constant intercourse they may be all the better able to consult in common in case of need besides the pole march three other members of the peers share the royal quarters mess etc the duty of these is to attend to all matters of commissariat in order that the king and the rest may have unbroken leisure to attend to affairs of actual warfare but i will resume at a somewhat higher point and describe the manner in which the king sets out on an expedition as a preliminary step before leaving home he offers sacrifice in company with his staff to zeus agitor the leader and if the victims prove favorable then and there the priest who bears the sacred fire takes thereof from off the altar and leads the way to the boundaries of the land here for the second time the king does sacrifice to zeus and athena and as soon as the offerings are accepted by those two divinities he steps across the boundaries of the land and all the while the fire from those sacrifices leads the way and is never suffered to go out behind follow beasts for sacrifice of every sort invariably when he offers sacrifice the king begins the work in the gloaming ere the day has broken being minded to anticipate the good will of the god and round about the place of sacrifice are present the pole marches and captains the lieutenants and sub-lieutenants with the commandants of the baggage train and any general of the states who may care to assist there too are to be seen two of the ephors who neither meddle nor make save only at the summons of the king yet have they their eyes fixed on the proceedings of each one there and keep all in order as may well be guessed when the sacrifices are accomplished the king summons all and issues his orders as to what has to be done and all with such method that to witness the proceedings you might fairly suppose the rest of the world to be but bungling experimenters and the lacedaemonians alone true handicraftsmen in the art of soldiering anon the king puts himself at the head of the troops and if no enemy appears he heads the line of march no one preceding him except the skirite and the mounted troops exploring in front if however there is any reason to anticipate a battle the king takes the leading column of the first army corps and wheels to the right until he has got into position with two army corps and two generals of division on either flank the disposition of the supports is assigned to the eldest of the royal council or staff corps acting as brigadier 
the staff consisting of all peers who share the royal mess and quarters with the soothsayers surgeons and pipers whose place is in the front of the troops with finally any volunteers who happen to be present so that there is no check or hesitation in anything to be done every contingency is provided for the following details also seem to me of high utility among the inventions of lycurgus with a view to the final arbitrament of battle whensoever the enemy being now close enough to watch the proceedings the goat is sacrificed then says the law let all the pipers in their places play upon the pipes and let every lacedaemonian don a wreath then too so runs the order let the shields be brightly polished the privilege is accorded to the young man to enter battle with his long locks combed to be of cheery countenance that too is of good repute onward they pass the word of command to the subaltern in command of his section since it is impossible to hear along the whole of each section from the particular subaltern posted on the outside it devolves finally on the pole march to see that all goes well when the right moment for encamping has come the king is responsible for that and has to point out the proper place the dispatch of emissaries however whether to friends or to foes is not the king's affair petitioners in general wishing to transact anything treat in the first instance with the king if the case concerns some point of justice the king dispatches the petitioner to the helanodaki who formed the court-martial if of money to the paymasters if the petitioner brings booty he is sent off to the lapyropoli or sellers of spoil this being the mode of procedure no other duty is left to the king whilst he is on active service except to play the part of priest in matters concerning the gods and of commander-in-chief in his relationship to men part fourteen now if the question be put to me do you maintain that the laws of lycurgus remain still to this day unchanged that indeed is an assertion which i should no longer venture to maintain knowing as i do that in former times the lacedaemonians preferred to live at home on moderate means content to associate exclusively with themselves rather than to play the part of governor-general in foreign states and to be corrupted by flattery knowing further as i do that formerly they dreaded to be detected in the possession of gold whereas nowadays there are not a few who make it their glory and their boast to be possessed of it i am well aware that in former days alien acts were put in force for this very object to live abroad was not allowed and why simply in order that the citizens of sparta might not take the infection of dishonesty and light living from foreigners whereas now i am very well aware that those who are reputed to be leading citizens have but one ambition and that is to live to the end of their days as governors general on a foreign soil the days were when their sole anxiety was to fit themselves to lead the rest of hellas but nowadays they concern themselves much more to wield command than to be fit themselves to rule and so it has come to pass that whereas in old days the states of hellas flocked to lacedaemon seeking her leadership against the supposed wrongdoer now numbers are inviting one another to prevent the lacedaemonians again recovering their empire yet if they have incurred all these reproaches we need not wonder seeing that they are so plainly disobedient to the god himself and to the laws of their own lawgiver lycurgus part fifteen i wish to explain with sufficient detail the nature of the covenant between king and state as instituted by lycurgus for this i take is the sole type of rule which still preserves the original form in which it was first established whereas other constitutions will be found either to have been already modified or else to be still undergoing modifications at this moment lycurgus laid it down as law 
that the king shall offer in behalf of the state all public sacrifices as being himself of divine descent and whithersoever the state shall dispatch her armies the king shall take the lead he granted him to receive honorary gifts of the things offered in sacrifice and he appointed him choice lands in many of the provincial cities enough to satisfy moderate needs without excess wealth and in order that the kings also might camp and mess in public he appointed them public quarters and he honored them with a double portion each at the evening meal not in order that they might actually eat twice as much as others but that the king might have wherewithal to honor whomsoever he desired he also granted as a gift to each of the two kings to choose two messmates which same are called pathoi he also granted them to receive out of every litter of swine one pig so that the king might never be at a loss for victims if in aught he wished to consult the gods close by the palace a lake affords an unrestricted supply of water and how useful that is for various purposes they best can tell who lack the luxury more so all rise from their seats to give place to the king save only that the ephors rise not from their thrones of office monthly they exchange oaths the ephors in behalf of the state the king himself in his own behalf and this is the oath on the king's part i will exercise my kingship in accordance with the established laws of the state and on the part of the state the oath runs so long as he who exercises kingship shall abide by his oaths we will not suffer his kingdom to be shaken these then are the honors bestowed upon the king during his lifetime at home honors by no means much exceeding those of private citizens since the lawgiver was minded neither to suggest to the kings the pride of the despotic monarch nor on the other hand to engender in the heart of the citizen envy of their power as to those other honors which are given to the king at his death the laws of lycurgus would seem plainly to signify hereby that these kings of lacedaemon are not mere mortals but heroic beings and that is why they are preferred in honor end of parts eight through fifteen end of the polity of the lacedaemonians